Ziara, I like the open-endedness of your prayer. Lord, prepare us for whatever it is you're about to teach us today. I'm kind of just as eager to find out what it is the Lord has to teach us this morning. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Luke chapter 4. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can slip up your hand. We'll put a Bible in your hand. You can get one of the Grace Notes sheet. As always, at the bottom is the connection card. If you have prayer requests or praises, we encourage you to fill that out. You can tear off the connection card and drop it in one of the offering boxes on either side of the room, also in the back of the room. That's a great way to get in touch with us. You can also, if you have tithes or offerings that you're not giving online, you can give those in person. Reminder, uh, we are coming up, as Cameron mentioned, on a big celebration weekend as a church, 40 years. And we've got a whole host of opportunities to engage in that celebration. Uh, This Friday, we have songs and stories from the first 40. And the song we just sang, Anchor of My Soul, it was written here in this Grace community by Taylor Breen and Lauren Sedembrini. And so uh, Taylor is actually going to be here Friday night leading that song. Among many others, we'll have Aaron Keyes back in town leading some of the songs he wrote. We'll have some other uh, just great worship leaders from around the Grace family. Some of our Snellville worship leaders will be telling a few stories and really praying blessing over the Grace family. Should be an amazing event to remember and to celebrate and to praise God uh, through songs that we've written here. And then Saturday for our leaders and volunteers, whether you're a student leader or, or you're a grown-up adult leader, whatever it may be, it's going to be a great uh, day of training from 9 until 3. And then Sunday, we'll be right back here at our regular times, 9 and 1030, to worship together, to read the word together. And then following this 1030 gathering next week, we're going to have a big lunch all together. And we'll have some inflatables for the kids to play. Here is what I'm asking you to do. Please register and let us know if you're coming to one, two, or all three of these events. Um, Because, uh, especially even on Sunday, if you're going to be here, you're going to eat lunch with us, maybe you're going to bring a dish to pass, a side dish, uh, that lets us know, if you register, how many to expect for food. And so you can follow that QR code on the slide. You can go to gfc.tv. Both will get you to that registration, and you can let us know if you're coming on Friday, Friday and Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, I don't know, Saturday, Friday, whatever all the permutations of a weekend events are, uh, you can do it all in one registration, so please let us know. Is Saturday here? Saturday will be here, yes. All of the events are right here at Grace Neville, sort of the original church for the Grace family. All right, so we're now picking up with 40 in our minds. We're picking up uh, these 40 stories. We started last week looking at stories involving the number 40 in the Old Testament. And now we're going to look at a couple of 40 stories in the New Testament. And as we saw last week, in the Bible, the number 40 is a big deal. We saw five stories last week in the Old Testament where 40 played an important role. We had Noah... 40 days of rain, of the flood, a season of purification and renewal in the earth. We have Moses, 40 days on top of Mount Sinai. Of course, he had to come down after the first 40 and kind of fix the golden calf worship situation. That was messy. He went back up for another 40 days. Revelation and the presence of God. You've got the spies as the people of Israel left Mount Sinai and came to the very border of the promised land. They sent in 12 spies to check out that land. And they were there for 40 days exploring the land before they came out. And you remember that the people said, we don't trust God. We're too afraid of the enemies. We're not going to go into the promised land. But that season of spying out the land was a season of exploration and dreaming. Then... People spent 40 years in the wilderness because they didn't trust God, but eventually they make it to the promised land. In the promised land during the time of Saul and David, the first kings of Israel, Goliath, their enemy, taunted the armies of Israel for 40 days, a season of fear and deliverance. And then finally we saw later on in the story of Israel's kingdom, Elijah, the prophet who follows up his great victory at the top of Mount Carmel against the prophets of Baal, by a real season of depression. 
And he goes out into the wilderness 40 days before hearing from God in a season of renewed calling. So each of these 40 stories that we looked at had a different sort of outcome or flavor or focus with God, whether it's purification or renewal, but there's a common theme. And the common theme is that every time this number 40 appears, it seems to be associated with some kind of test, some kind of um, um, proving, some, some kind of drawing out of where God's people or where an individual is with God. And part of the reason 40 is a significant number is that it's long enough to really show what's going on inside someone or inside of a community. Like anybody can fake put on a good show for a short amount of time. Like for example, I could go out to a marathon and I could wear all the right clothes and you know the shoes and everything and I could even look like a decent marathon runner for one mile. <laughs> but like mile two, that's a long enough distance to reveal the level of my distance training as a runner, not strong. Like anybody can fake it for a short amount of time. The idea with 40 is that it's long enough to really show what's going on. And remember, the Jewish community followed the lunar calendar, right? So a uh, cycle of the moon was about 28, 29 days. And that was like a month. So the idea of 40 is this is more than a month. This, this is longer than a month to really see what's going on in your life. But whether it was 40 days or 40 years, as in the case of people wandering in the wilderness, these seasons of testing really reveal what's going on in a person, what's really going on in a community. Remember all the way back to the Garden of Eden, we saw after Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they're hiding from God, and God, when he's walking in the garden, says, where are you? This is one of the great questions that God asks and continues to ask us, where are you? And God is not confused about the answer. He knows where you are. He knows what's going on. He knows what's growing. He knows what's rotting. He knows everything that's going on in you. The problem is we often don't know what's going on in us. We are so prone to moving from one thing to the next thing. Our calendars are fast. We soak up every extra moment with some kind of attention paid to a screen somewhere. It's like we can live for years without really knowing what's going on in us. It's entirely possible to go through a good chunk of your life without ever really knowing where you are. And so these seasons of 40 are actually blessed seasons. I mean, they're hard and they're testing and there's trials, but the gift of these seasons is how they show us where we are. This is exactly what God says about the 40 years the people spent in the wilderness. This is from the book of Deuteronomy, which was Moses' last sermon to the people before they went into the promised land after 40 years of wandering. And in Deuteronomy 8, verse 2, it says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. These seasons of 40, they're tests that assess where we are, draw it into the open so that we can grow, so that we can advance. What's interesting is that when you look closely at these 40 stories in the Old Testament, the people involved usually don't do very well with the tests. Usually, like Elijah is struggling, uh, the people listening to Goliath are quavering in fear, the people of Israel are doubting God. Like when these seasons of testing fall upon God's people, the answer to the question, where are you, is not great. Usually, failing. That's the answer. But that's all about to change in Luke chapter 4. And Luke 4 picks up in the New Testament this theme of 40. 
And it's with Jesus. And Jesus, where we are in the book of Luke, he has just been baptized. It's a landmark day in the life of Jesus. The description of his baptism is pretty stunning. It says, when he comes out of the water, the heavens part, the Holy Spirit descends on him in the bodily form of a dove and a voice from heaven says, this is my son. I really love him and I'm really proud of him. Like this is one of those, like just won the championship moments in Jesus' life. If there was a sideline reporter doing a post-game interview with Jesus on the banks of the Jordan River, you know, Jesus would be coming out here right after being doused and the reporter would be like, this is amazing. You know, how do you feel? And Jesus would be like, great. And then be like, what are you going to do next? And this is where the stereotypical reply would be, well, we're going to Disney. And actually what happens is the complete opposite. Jesus out of the baptismal waters of the Jordan does not go to Disney. He goes to the wilderness alone. Look at this chapter four, verse one, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit left the Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. At the end of them, he was hungry. <laughs> Love that description. And this setup, if you really think about it, is not very pleasant. Jesus is alone. Jesus is hungry. And you kind of get a sense of the kind of person you are if you zero in on one or the other of those. I would much rather face temptation well-fed and alone than with people and hungry. That's just how I am. I, like, I really am a hungry person. Amy and I starting off this year, we're like doing one of those, you know, kind of strip back your diet and then add things back in just see how it feels when you start eating ice cream again. <laughs> And so, like, I haven't had meat for, like, we, we, you know, it's so all veg, vegetarian for the last, like, eight or nine days, you know. And um, I'll just say I would much rather face temptation well-fed and alone than with people and hungry. And so, uh, but other people are like, I, I don't care what's in my stomach. I just want to be around people. I don't want to be alone. Like, there's all, Jesus has got the double whammy. He's alone and he's hungry and he's being tempted by the devil. This sounds like a terrible situation, and in many ways, it is unpleasant. But the scripture also says that the Spirit of God has led Jesus to this place. That means that he's in the wilderness, alone and hungry for a purpose. And last week, when we were looking at the Old Testament 40 stories, we talked about the importance of a sovereign mindset, especially when you find yourself in one of those seasons of testing, when you're in one of those 40 stories and God's bringing stuff out of you and working in your life, like the sovereign mindset is so important because often the situations are unpleasant. But if you understand that God is good and that he's doing something and even if you don't know quite what it is, if you can just trust, okay, God, you're doing something, it's essential to processing those 40 seasons, those 40 stories really well. And if you don't have a sovereign mindset, if you don't have that recognition of, of God at work in your life, sometimes you can find yourself alone, isolated, and in need, hungry like Jesus, and mistakenly think that God has cast you off, that God no longer cares about you. I remember years ago, I had a Saab. I love that car. It was a 1994 Saab. It was like my dream car. Um, in retrospect, I understand why people would always tease me about it because it was a very quirky car. But I love that car and somehow convinced Amy to marry me while I was driving that car. <laughs> and I remember the day when finally it's, mechanical issues kind of overwhelmed the vehicle. I just had to raise the white flag. I'd done a lot of repairs and things. And it's like, finally, it's time to get rid of this car. And I called the wrecker company and they came to my driveway, loaded it up and took it off to the junkyard. It was such a sad day. Like in my mind, I still can see that car like 
going away, and his headlights almost like had eyes, like from the movie Cars, kind of looking at me like, <laughs> or something. And if we're honest, when we find ourselves in situations where we are alone and we are in need, we might think that God has just called the record company, is carrying us off to the junkyard, and is totally done with us. But that's not how God is. It's not what God has done in Jesus' life. It's not what he does in our lives. Sometimes when we're alone and in need, it's one of those 40 stories where God is drawing out where we are so that we can move forward together. And notice, it's so encouraging to me that Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. This is not God casting off Jesus. This is God doing something really important in Jesus' life and for all of us to be able to look and learn from. Verse three, the devil said to Jesus, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The first temptation in the wilderness. And if you have ever been to this part of the world, you know it is very, very rocky. This is a picture of the Judean Judean wilderness, and it's bleak, it's hot, uh, but also everywhere on the ground are stones. And so this first temptation from the devil to Jesus is a temptation that really begins to work with Jesus' imagination. Because if you were hungry long enough, you could look at those stones and start to think, those, those would make nice biscuits, you know? And so Satan starts working with the imagination of Jesus, like, you're powerful, you are hungry, why don't you just make those lovely golden brown stones into lovely golden brown biscuits? And the heart of this temptation is not merely about Jesus' appetite or hunger. It's really a temptation for Jesus to take matters into his own hands, to use his own power to meet his needs, for Jesus to take control of the situation for himself. And Jesus knows God is at work out here in the wilderness. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit and he's hungry. So the devil tempts him to take control into his own hands. And Jesus' reply is amazing. He says, man does not live on bread alone. It's a quotation from the book of Deuteronomy. If you continue it, it says that he lives on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Rather than looking after my own physical needs with my own power and my own control, Jesus says a healthy, full life as it's designed to be is a life that is listening to God, looking to God. What are God's words for providing for this situation? Jesus says, I'm not going to take control in my own strength. Then verse five, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now the details here suggest that we might understand this showdown between Jesus and the devil in some ways to be like visionary. It's hard to know quite what physical, literal scenario would involve the devil and Jesus being able to see all the kingdoms of the world in an instant. Like even if you were whisked into space, you can only see half the hemispheres. So possibly this scenario, this temptation is being worked out in the battlefield of Jesus' mind and imagination. And 
the devil offers to Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And we have to remember the background to this story, that the voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism just declared Jesus to be the Son of God. And that is a major title in Scripture, and it means, among other things, that Jesus is the promised king who will one day be recognized as God's king over all the earth. And the devil says, hey, you want to rule? You're the king? Like, why don't you just take it all right now? All you have to do is bow to me. And this is the temptation to sell your soul in exchange for power. This is the temptation to take a shortcut, to make a concession, to compromise your moral standards, to worship the wrong thing in order to gain power. And Jesus will have none of that. Once again, he quotes from Deuteronomy, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus understands, even at this stage, that his calling to be king is going to involve his life and then his crucifixion and the resurrection. If Jesus were to simply shortcut the process, sure, he could have a real kind of influence and throne, but he would be, number one, beholden to the enemy. Number two, he would have sinned. So he couldn't really offer himself as a sinless sacrifice for the people. And so number three, he could rule, but he would rule without bringing along and redeeming the people that he came to earth to save. This is one of those temptations that the ends justify the means. Well, Jesus, you're going to be the king. Why don't you just become the king right now? And the way to do that is simply to compromise your heart of worship for God and give that heart to me. I know when you put it in such stark terms here in Luke chapter 4, you think, well, who would ever worship the devil? But if you sit with this story for a little bit and let it seep into the situation of your own life, there are so many temptations of things we want to worship, that we want to give ourselves toward. And often the reason we worship money or politics, the reason we give our hearts to these kind of ambitious endeavors is because they promise power in return. If I just have enough money, then I'll be in control. I could do whatever I want. And that temptation, well, it's the kingdom without the cross. And Jesus refuses the kingdom without the cross. He refuses to worship the devil. He refuses to walk away from God. He says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So then the third temptation, verse 9, it says the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, a little geography might help get more perspective on this temptation. This is a picture of the modern-day Temple Mount. It's overseen by the Muslim community, specifically the nation of Jordan. But the foundations of the Temple Mount remain from the time of Jesus. They were built by King Herod. And so here, on this corner of the Temple Mount, there would have been a tower, one of the high places around that temple. Here's a computer recreation of what that temple mount may have looked like. You've got the giant temple complex here in the center. Uh, there's actually a Roman fortress over here keeping watch over all of the people in the temple. But on this corner, you have this high place and the 
the priests would make announcements to the city out here from that high place. And most scholars believe that this temptation is at least referencing that kind of high corner of the temple. Here's more of a street level computer recreation of what that would look like. You have this high, high place all the way up here and you see down below all the crowds and the market and very, very busy area. So when the devil says to Jesus, you know, just throw yourself off this high part of the temple and the scripture promises that the angels will protect you He's not just telling Jesus to test God's faithfulness for Jesus personally. He's actually saying, Jesus, why don't you undertake a pretty significant publicity stunt? It's the sort of thing that would be seen by many and then word of mouth would be passed along. Did you hear about the guy? Yeah, he jumped off. Yeah, and then he didn't die. Yeah, it was amazing. It's like a whole superhero thing. And it just spins up like that. The tabloids get going. The newspapers get going. It's this whole big story. And it looks like it would be an act of great faith. God said it. He's going to protect his anointed one. I believe it. So I'm going to jump off here and he's going to protect me. But in fact, this kind of action in a relationship with God is an ultimatum kind of thing. And that is not a healthy way to have a relationship with anybody. In fact, the world of political science gives us a term to describe that kind of relationship. They developed this term during the Cold War. They said it's brinkmanship, where you have the West and the Soviet Union using tactics of fear and intimidation as strategies to make the other side do what they wanted. Well, if you don't do this, we're going to nuke you. Oh, yeah? Well, if you nuke us, we'll nuke you more. Whatever, I will double nuke you back. And I know I shouldn't be joking about the Cold War. I grew up like in the 80s. And so Berlin Wall fell when I was like eight or nine years old. So it didn't have quite the same formative impression on me as I know it did on the generation a little bit older than me. But it's true that that sort of back and forth ultimatum relationship, brinkmanship, constantly bringing the world to the brink of disaster was an incredibly unhealthy way to do foreign policy. And maybe that's the only way that you could make it work in the real politic world of nations. But when it comes to a relationship with God, brinkmanship is not the way to go. Ultimatums is not the way to go. And yet, for some reason, we still have in our minds these sort of phrases like, God, if you really love me, then you will. Or God, if you really are a healer, then you will. Or God, if you really are a provider, then you will. And we kind of like lob these ultimatums at God. And if God doesn't come through exactly the way we want, we're like, well, God, you guess, you know, and then we kind of hold it against like that. Jesus just says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's not how a relationship with God is made to work. Let's not turn our relationship with God into the Cold War. Don't get into an arms race with God. Like this idea of just putting God in a position where he has to work miraculously, it's not really a real relationship. That's a using relationship. And Jesus wants nothing to do with that. And so, verse 13, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Then verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. Few outcomes looking at this 40 story. Number one, we talked about the track record of people in seasons of temptation in the Old Testament and how in those seasons of temptation, testing, in their 40 stories, the people did not come through great. God was super faithful. God was super gracious. The people, not so much. Now, for the first time in human history, we find a person who succeeds in temptation, who excels, who does not give in to the devil's lies. Jesus succeeds 
where Adam failed. Jesus succeeds where the people of Israel failed. Jesus succeeds. And so this gives us a very, very important anchor point when we are processing a 40 story in our own life. If it's up to us to come through that season of temptation and trial in our own strength, we are in trouble. In those seasons, we need to keep looking back to Jesus. All right, Lord, what's your example? What were your words? What did you do? And that leads to the second takeaway. Jesus, in this time of temptation, leans heavily on the scripture. I heard a preacher say years ago that Jesus could have called angels to like beat the devil up. Jesus could have revealed his glory like he did at the Mount of Transfiguration, just sort of blasted the devil out of there. Jesus didn't do any of the things that we couldn't do. What, what Jesus did is answer the devil with scripture, which is something that is incredibly accessible to every single one of us. And it's interesting because Jesus is not the only one in the story who uses the scripture. In the third temptation here, the devil actually starts quoting from Psalm 91, where it says that God is gonna protect his anointed one. Look at this. The devil says, it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. Now, that's a quote from Psalm 91. We've got the full text of Psalm 91 down here. The scripture in Psalm 91 says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Now that phrase, in all your ways, is conveniently left out when the devil is tempting Jesus. Why? Well, because that little phrase, in all your ways, said, it suggests that, that God's protection is promised for people walking in the ways of God not for people who are just jumping off towers trying to test God and give God ultimatums. So the devil takes a promise from Psalm 91, but he kind of edits it and he omits important context and then he brings it to Jesus as if it is trustworthy. And in fact, it isn't. And I just wonder sometimes how many people are trying to follow Jesus and they'll get a little snippet of scripture here or there, a little bit of a promise, but it's not the full context of the promise. And they'll be holding on to that promise thinking like, this is what the word says. And they're well-intentioned, but they're just simple. They just haven't actually gone back and read what the scripture actually has to say. You can be led astray by promises taken out of context, which is why you need to really become a student of the scripture. Maybe you're just starting out. Maybe you're just trying to figure out the Bible. You got just a few verses in your head. Maybe you don't have any verses at all. Okay, great, that's where you are. But where are you growing? And our hope would be that every single one of us would grow deep in the scripture, that we would know the scripture. I think about the foundation of this building and the fact that there's a Bible like in the concrete of the building open to Psalm 1. Because when we moved here 24 years ago, that conviction that we would be people of the book, scriptural people, that we would go deep, whether we are just starting, we've been a lifetime in the scripture, like that we would be people similar to Jesus who depend on the scripture. Of course, Psalm 1 talks about the person whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on it day and night. One of the linchpin values, we are rooted in the scripture here at Grace. In fact, uh, evangelical, like that phrase, used to mean the people who believe the Bible's true. That was like the leading definition of the word evangelical. It's a word that comes from the Greek, euangelion, evangelism, the good news. Like good news people who believe in the Bible. That's what evangelical like, meant. Nowadays, if you listen to the culture, it means like a voting block. I don't know, how do we go from being people who believe the Bible to people who vote a certain way? Like, that's not cool. 
Let's get back to what Jesus shows us here, that we are people who know the scriptures. And when temptation comes knocking in those seasons of trial, we answer not with some thin promise that we pulled off of some greeting card, but with a real thick knowledge of what God's truth has to say. The last thing here that we see from Jesus, we, in the seasons of trial and temptation, like first of all, we look to Jesus because he's the one who succeeds. Then what do we see in Jesus? We see he leans on the scripture, but also there's this spiritual aspect of what happens in Jesus. You may have noticed it when we were reading through, but in Luke 4 verse 1, Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit led into the wilderness. But then in verse 14, when Jesus comes back to Galilee, he returned in the power of the Spirit. So full of the Spirit, temptation and trial for 40 days, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's pretty remarkable. Like what happens in those 40 days such that the scripture describes Jesus coming now into Galilee full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And as I've sat with that, as I've meditated on that and asked that question, because I want to be full of the Spirit, but I really want to be full of the power of the Holy Spirit. The, the power of the Holy Spirit speaks to the ability to do what God is calling us to do. When we have the power of the Holy Spirit, it means we have the power to do in the world what God is calling us to do. Like what happens before the temptation to after the temptation in the life of Jesus? And as much as I can tell, as I've sat with this and, and just prayed about it, you see the temptations of the devil to Jesus in the wilderness, those are the kind of temptations that get to all of us. Uh, they're temptations of our appetite, uh, temptations for uh, uh, ambition and power, temptations to gain approval from the people around us, right? And, and all of those things are very, very powerful realities in our world, our appetites, the ambition for power, the, the, the longing for approval and fame and people to like us and everything like that. Like those are incredibly powerful forces in the world. And Jesus going through that temptation shows that he is not under the power of his appetite. He is not under the power of his ambition. He's not under the power of approval to others. Like he's free from all those things. He refuses to bow down to Satan. He's free from all that. And so what does that mean? That means he's full of the power of the spirit. If you want to be full of the power of God's spirit, then you need to be free from being under the power of anything else. That's what happens. Like the question of Jesus, where are you? Jesus is not subjected or beholden to or in slavery to any of these other kinds of powers, which means he is fully surrendered and submitted to the Holy Spirit capable of doing whatever the Lord leads him to do. The world will tell us, hey, if you just want it bad enough, you, you'll do whatever it takes, that, that, that you know, you gotta do whatever you can to get your power, get your influence, get your, like all those messages of the world. But here's what we see in Jesus' temptation. He comes through all that. He's like, none of those worldly powers exercise an ounce of undue influence over me. And that's what it means to be full of the power of the Holy Spirit. A life fully devoted, fully open, unenslaved. Jesus with God. And so, of course, from this point of temptation, Jesus goes on to call disciples. He has religious leaders. Uh, he has miracles. He has teaching. Like a whole life of Jesus plays out leading to the cross, dies on the cross, is resurrected on the third day. And the last little 40 story we're going to touch is just one verse here. It's in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. It's the only other specifically 40 story in the New Testament. And of course, Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. 
So we sh probably shouldn't be surprised that there is a connection here with these numbers 40. Jesus coming through the temptation, lives his life, dies, is resurrected. And it says in Acts 1 verse 3, after his suffering, Jesus presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to his followers over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. If a season of 40 is a season of proving, of testing, of drawing out what's really there, this final 40 story of Jesus with his followers for 40 days teaching about the kingdom of God after the crucifixion and resurrection is a proving that he is in fact alive and resurrected. It's a validation and vindication of the life that he has lived, that he surrendered control in going to the cross. He didn't bow down to the devil, but rather trusted the word of the Father in surrendering his life. And when he went to the cross, it was not some publicity stunt jumping off the top of a high tower to gain fame. It was exactly what the will of God was for him. And yet, just like Psalm 91 promised, he was protected. Now, he wasn't protected from the lash or the crown of thorns or from beating or from dying on the cross. But he was protected, actually, through death into resurrection, the fulfillment of Psalm 91. And so this final 40 story in Acts, just 40 days teaching about the kingdom of God. In some ways, it's the summary of all these 40 stories. This recognition of Jesus, his resurrection, and how we find a place in his kingdom. And as we zoom out and apply this text, this 40 story, or a couple of 40 stories to where we are, once more, if you are in a season of testing and trial, 40 story of your own, look to Jesus, lean on the scripture, and learn to open your heart to the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus models for us. And then for us as a church, 40 years, question I'm asking is, Lord, what is it that we have learned? What have you revealed? What have you drawn out in these 40 years? Where are we? So that as we look forward as a church, as a community, we might dream with God, not pursuing fame, not selling our soul exchange for power, not even trying to gratify our appetites, but Lord, as we dream forward with you, that you would lead us in a place of freedom from all these other powers so that we might be really full of your power in this place. As so we're praying on both levels, personally and congregationally, for the Lord to give us dreams, to give us power, to give us wisdom and insight ultimately that we would continue walking with the Lord, not in some kind of ultimatum relationship, but in a kind of relationship of deep trust and confidence that he's good, and that he's sovereign. And so Lord, we pray all these things that you would bless us, that you would bless our people, you'd bless our kids, that you would bless our generations, that you'd bless our community, Lord. We pray that you would inspire our imaginations where the devil I tried to distort Jesus' imagination to self-serving goals. Lord, I pray you would uh, restore our imaginations to see what you see and go after what you would have us go after. Lord, we want to be a faithful people who worships you and serves you only. Would you continue to bring about that in our lives? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks for watching this Grace Snellville video. We want to help you get connected to everything happening around the Grace Snellville community. We want to pray with you, and we want to help equip you to follow Jesus well. Would you just take a moment, even now, to go to our website at gracesnellville.com. We hope to see you soon.